Hello and welcome to Rec, the Michael Rechtenwald podcast. This is episode three, and my, I am joined today by Walter Block. Walter is the Harold E. Worth Eminent Scholar Endowed Chair in Economics at Loyola University. He's a senior fellow at the Mises Institute and author of numerous books and myriad, a myriad of articles. Uh, Block, Walter Block is a leading Austrian school economist and an international leader of the freedom movement. His earliest work, Defending the Undefendable, published in, first published in 1976, is now more than 30 years later still regarded as a classic of libertarianism. Block's writing has, was inspired by Henry Hazlitt, the author of the most widely read economics text, Economics in One Lesson. Block's latest books include class, The Classical Liberal Case for Israel and The Case for Privatizing Oceans, Rivers, Lakes, and Aquifers. I've asked Walter to join me today primarily to discuss the topic that has gained some traction of late, and that is reparations. But Walter has also agreed to discuss uh, so-called shareholder capitalism as well as immigration uh, Walter, I want to begin by just uh, addressing something that's come up today, and that is uh, the Ukrainian conflict. Uh, Lindsey Graham has just suggested that he's going to uh, issue a, uh, a resolution in, in the Senate uh, to have uh, Ukraine admitted into NATO. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, I, I have thoughts on that. I think it's a very, very, very bad idea. Uh, when East Germany and West Germany got together with Russia's permission, there was a promise made by NATO and the U.S. that uh, NATO would not move east. And guess what? This was 1991. Uh, they moved east. And uh, right now, Ukraine is right on the border of Russia. How would we feel if uh, the reverse was occurring? Well, we know how we would feel because um, uh, the Soviets did that in, in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, they located uh, weapons of mass destruction in Cuba 90 miles away from us. And uh, Kennedy was not a happy camper. Uh, he, in effect, uh, engaged in war against them by uh, blockading uh, Cuba. A blockade is an act of war. Uh, now China is thinking of putting some stuff in uh, Cuba, and the U.S. does not like it one bit. Well, uh, Ukraine is closer to Russia than Cuba is to, to Florida. It's 90 miles away, whereas uh, Ukraine is right on the border. Uh, Russia is pleaded with and uh, said that th this is a, uh, a threat to their, to their existence. And yet we have this inexorable march eastward of NATO, uh, what is the matter with these people? I mean, you know, they have this uh, clock, how close are we to nuclear war? We're as close to nuclear war now as we were in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And this maniac, I use the word advisedly, is now uh, saying that the uh, 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 Ukraine should be part of NATO. I mean, this is just preposterous. Uh, again, uh, we can't put our... Uh, eyes in the other guy's eyes, or, and we can't look at their uh, position. I mean, suppose it was reverse. Suppose that um, the Soviet Union was in the U.S., and uh, and the U.S. was in, in what is now Russia, and, and the Soviet Union keeps moving eastward. We, uh, American Soviets, if I can put the, make that phrase up, would not like that one bit. And the proof of this is we didn't like it when they, they pulled the stuff on in Cuba. Um, it, it, this is just crazy, and um, anyone who supports this uh, can't see the other guy's uh, position at all. Yeah, I can't. I couldn't agree with you more. And also, this would immediately and officially have the United States at war with Russia because of Article Five of NATO's uh, own uh, declarations. So this would make us. Uh, this would put us at war, and this would be. This would basically be World War Three. Yeah, I mean, do we really need World War III? Uh, I mean, I mean the, the whole thing is preposterous. You have two nuclear-armed uh, countries, uh, very, very powerful, and China is looking upon this uh, with, with great interest. And, um, I, I mean, the, the whole thing is just, I, I can't, um, 
I wish I were more poetic and I could say it better, that, but that this is preposterous, it's horrible, it's awful, and it, it shouldn't occur. And the people responsible for it should be, um, I don't know what, voted out or punished in some way because they're pushing us toward a nuclear war. Yeah, I mean, what do you think's behind this? I mean, are they just trying to exact uh, regime change in Russia? Is that the bottom line? Probably. I, I mean, the U.S. is a bully. The U.S. Right. has 800 military bases in foreign countries. No other country has anything like that. Russia doesn't have that. China doesn't have that. Uh, again, when they, I hate to keep re repeating, uh, repeating about Cuba, but when they put one foreign military base in, in Cuba, the U.S. went apoplectic. Uh, yeah. And yet the U.S. has got military bases all around Russia. And has for many years 800 military bases in 130 countries, and they call that defense. I mean, we just got finished with basketball season, and the people who watch basketball they know the difference between offense and defense. When the other team has the ball, you yell defense. Uh, they can distinguish defense and offense. Well, the U.S. is being offensive, not defensive. Absolutely, it's it's a, a preposterous and just uh, the most irresponsible and insane. Uh, policy uh, stance that uh, I've seen in many years, if not all my life. Uh, anyway, that's that's international geopolitics. Let's turn to something a little closer to home. Um, after two years of intense public hearings, the California Reparations Task Force voted to approve a more than 1,000-page document, including uh, more than 200 recommendations for how to undo centuries of unfair treatment for black Californians, especially the descendants of enslaved peoples. It recommended uh, that California formally apologize for its role in enabling slavery and for the many tentacles of so-called white supremacy in history. It also recommended that the state make cash payments to those whose ancestors were enslaved. Cal Matters Reparation Calculator, this exists, based on economic modeling in the task force's report, estimates that an eligible black resident who has lived uh, seven decades in California could be owed up to 100, uh, I'm sorry, $1.2 million. So this task force then issued this report on June 29th, 2023, and uh, it's now up to the uh, to the uh, Senate of the California Senate uh, to decide on what to do with this recommendation and how much money should be uh, should be given as restitution. Um, you've addressed, uh, I think, eloquently in, in many places the, the question of reparations in terms of property rights. Do you mind recounting that argument briefly here? And, and then we can talk about this specific uh, case. Well, yes, I'd be delighted to do it. It's a very important question. Uh, first of all, California was never a slave state. It was not in the Confederacy. So uh, what has California got to do with slavery is, is an interesting question. Uh, there are two people who are mainly associated with the uh, case for reparations. That would be um, Randall Robinson and uh, Tahishi Coates. And there's one person who is mainly associated against that, and that would be David Horowitz, uh, who is with the Second Thoughts group. Uh, I think both are wrong. I think the proper libertarian view is neither one. Uh, what the left wing says is that all whites owe all blacks reparations to slavery. And what the right wing says is that no whites owe anything to any blacks for slavery. And I think both are wrong. Look, suppose I have a, a wristwatch and it's got your grandfather's picture in it. And we know that uh, my grandfather stole this watch from your grandfather. And the proof of it is your grandfather's picture is in the watch. And, and we have a picture of your grandfather wearing the watch before my grandfather stole it from him. Should I have to give you back the watch? Yeah. I mean, uh, assuming that had my grandfather not stolen the watch from your grandfather, your grandfather would have given it to your father. 
and your father would have given it to you, and you are the rightful owner of it. Uh, I'm not um, guilty uh, of a crime. I'm guilty of holding stolen property. But let's say I'm entirely innocent. I never looked inside the watch. My father gave me the watch from his father, the, my grandfather, the thief, and I have the watch, and I'm, I'm just sort of innocent, And but I should give you back the watch. So uh, that would be the case for reparations, but it's a very limited case, but it, it's certainly not all whites owe all blacks anything, because a lot of whites came to this country. I'm Jewish. My family came in 1905 or so, and, and <laughs> that had nothing to do with slavery. And then there are black people in this country now who came over five years ago, and they might have something to do with slavery in Africa, but they've got nothing to do with slavery here. And then there are black people who actually own slaves. So the whole thing is preposterous. Now, uh, another part of libertarianism is uh, possession is nine-tenths of the law, uh, not just libertarianism, but uh, all civilized legal codes would say whatever is is presumed to be uh, just, and the burden of proof is on somebody who wants to prove that the present uh, situation is unjust. So let's suppose there's this black guy in Harlem, and he can prove that his grandfather uh, lived uh, and worked in a plantation in, in South Carolina, and he's got the proof, and, uh, and let's say there were 100 slaves there. Now, what should have happened in 1865 is we should have had ex post facto law against slavery. We should have said, yes, slavery was legal. Uh, the Nuremberg trials certainly ex uh, established ex post facto law. I mean, the, the Nazis were saying, what are you uh, being on our case? So it was perfectly legal uh, under Nazi law to, you know, kill Jews and Arab, uh, 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 Jews and blacks and gays and uh, any non-Aryan. So I, I support um, ex post facto law, and I think we should apply ex post facto law to slavery and to say slavery, even though it was legal up until 18. 65 or 1863 is illegal and the people who were slave owners should be punished mm -hmm. and what should be the punishment they should be enslaved to the ex-slaves <laughs> okay and because they, they were guilty of kidnapping. You know, so yeah. you kidnap them and make them work in the fields or whatever. Now, uh, they're be long beyond the reach of justice because, you know, um, this is 150 years later. But uh, And what should have happened to their property? What should have happened to their property is not giving it to their children and, and their uh, grandchildren, and now this guy in South Carolina, a white guy, owns it. It should have gone to the slaves. And if there were 100 slaves uh, and there was a plantation of, um, I don't know, 1,000 acres, well, then each, uh, each slave should get 10 acres. Well, now let's get back to this black guy in Harlem who uh, can prove that his great-grandfather uh, worked in this plantation. He should be able to go to court and say, uh, sue the guy in South Carolina who is innocent, he's, but he's the uh, holder of stolen property, namely the plantation, and say, I want, you know, uh, one-tenth one or whatever it is, one one-hundredth of the plantation, and he should be given it. So we should have reparations in, uh, certainly in the... Um, uh, plantation acreage. Uh, and, but that would be very limited. And the burden of proof, I mean, you'd have to prove it. And 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 I don't believe in, um, uh, you know, uh, well, it's too late or anything like that. Um, uh, we, uh, the, I don't think that we should be have a statute of limitations. There is such a thing as a natural statute of limitations, namely the further back you go in history, the harder it is to prove anything. And very few black people now could prove that. But if they could, they are entitled to uh, reparations. And that would be my assessment as to what the proper libertarian position is. Reparations, if you can prove that there was stolen property, and, and we, we believe in return of stolen property. So this should be adjudicated privately, not, nothing to do with the state undertaking such measures, right? Well, uh, that would be the anarchist view, but if we are limited government libertarians, minarchists, uh, you go to the uh, government court and you say, and the black guy says, well, you know, my grandfather worked here, here's the proof. And uh, I want uh, 10 acres or, I mean, that's where they got this 40 acres and a mule stuff from because yeah. uh, on average uh, uh, it would have been 40 acres. And I, I think a government court should support this. And if you're taking the anarchist point of view, there shouldn't be any government courts, there shouldn't be any government, then private courts should adjudicate that. But that's a different issue. Right, right now we're, we're talking about reparations and it's a separate issue as to, you know, who's in charge of uh, courts. So if for some very strange reason you had been invited to be a member of this task force, 
would you have accepted? And if so, what would your input have consisted of? Well, I would have ins- I would have accepted. I mean, if if they paid me enough, sure. <laughs> and, even, and even if not, this would have uh, been a way of pu- publicizing libertarian theory. I would have accepted mm-hmm. even for for no money, and I would have made the case that I'm now making that if there's somebody in California, a black guy in California or woman, uh, and he can prove that uh, his grandfather was in Texas or Louisiana or somewhere in, in the, or even in the northern states. They had slavery in the north too. Mm-hmm. So it's not just a, a south thing. So uh, I would say that, yes, uh, he should, uh, the Californian black person should be able to go to court and, and sue somebody um, uh, yeah. in, in, under these uh, situations. But the, the thing is about this, is these reparations in California, they're not really uh, strictly limited to slavery itself. They want reparations for some of the following issues, racial terror, political disenfranchisement, housing segregation, separate and unequal education, racism in the environment and infrastructure, pathologizing the African-American family, control over creative, cultural, and intellectual life, stolen labor and hindered opportunity, an unjust legal system, mental and physical harm and neglect, and the wealth gap. So they want compensation for all these things, and compensation for mass incarceration, over policing, and the war on drugs, uh, the differential treatment of blacks in the war on drugs. uh, And they estimate uh, the reparations for just that aspect, the, the war on drugs, as $115,000 for every person who lived during that time, who, a black person who lived during that time. And in terms of housing discrimination, the report noted that since 1850, black ownership in California has been disproportionately lower than white ownership. So they're looking for reparations on all of these types of issues. Uh, including force, uh, 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 promoted segregation, uh, you know, all these different disparities. Uh, they're saying that, you know, basically uh, blacks should be uh, given payments uh, of more than $100,000 for uh, redlining and things like this. So what do you think of reparations based on these issues? Now, we know that the libertarian position about discrimination, but it wouldn't hurt to recount that. What about redressing issues like this? Well, I, I think you put your finger on one of the most important points, uh, discrimination. Um, discrimination is a right. People have a right to discriminate. Look, yeah. um, if you're against that, you're going to end up with compulsory bisexuality. Because look, male heterosexuals discriminate against half the human race in terms of bed partners, love interests, namely other men. Uh, Heterosexual women also are evil because they discriminate against half the human race, namely other women. Homosexual men, gay men, are, are evil because they discriminate against all women. And lesbians are also evil. Uh, I'm kidding about that, but that would yeah. be the logical implication because they discriminate against all men. Only bisexuals don't discriminate, so we should have compulsory bisexuality? I mean, that's the logic of this. Uh, you know, uh, we, we libertarians believe in uh, the non-aggression principle and private property rights based on homesteading and voluntary trade, and we also believe in free association. Nobody should be compelled to associate with anyone else against as well. That's the problem with rape. The rape victim doesn't want to associate with the rapist and is compelled to do it. That's the problem with slavery. The slaves didn't want to associate with the slave master and they were compelled to do it. Yeah. So now we're taking the opposite point of view. So uh, I, I think if there's discrimination or redlining or any of that stuff, it's not a, a crime. It, it's a right. So nobody should be um, uh, compensated for something that, that isn't um, uh, untoward. Um, uh, unequal wealth uh, comes from all sorts of sources. Yeah. One of the big sources of unequal wealth is uh, the breakdown of the black family due to um, uh, welfare of LBJ when, when he mm-hmm. ramped it up. Um, Charles Murray, who is famous for The Bell Curve, also wrote another very good book, uh, Losing Ground, where he makes this case. So 
part of the reason for the wealth imbalance is um, is the welfare system. Another yeah. part of it is um, different people have different talents. Uh, Thomas Sowell and Walter Williams uh, have done more good work on this than any other two people I can think of. And, and what they would say is that there are just different talents. I mean, LeBron James makes more money than you and I, and he's black and, and we're white. Uh, so, you know, there's nothing intrinsic about pigment that determines wealth. It's just different people have different different uh, different skills. Now, yeah. there is one area uh, where I have to sort of agree, and that's the drug thing. Yeah. What, what happened with the drug thing is that the Black Caucus of, of Congress was insistent that the, uh, the drugs that the black people used uh, be penalized even more than the yeah. drugs that white people. So if you're going to get any reparations out of that, you should get the reparations out of the Black Caucus of, of the Congress. Yeah. I mean, what about the issues where the state has a direct hand, for example, in seizing property, uh, and apparently differentially more so for blacks in terms of eminent domain? What, what, do, what do you think about that? Well, that would be unfair. There, there yeah. should be reparations for that, and it should be not from all whites. It should be from the people who did that. Yeah. And, and this is probably true. Eminent domain is probably used more against um, poor people than rich right. people because rich people are better organized and it just so happens that black people are poorer so we, so i don't think it's a racist thing i think it's a a wealth thing yeah. but it just so happens that black people are poorer so they're more victimized by that but we libertarians oppose uh, eminent domain so uh you know we yes there should be redress there but not from all white people but from the people responsible for the eminent domain a bunch of politicians and uh, bureaucrats they should pay for that Okay. Yeah. How would we do? How would we go about getting the people responsible to pay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I, I don't think we'll succeed, but that would right. be what justice would require. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, let's move on to um, another issue that's somewhat related, but not exactly. It's 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 mm -hmm. an economic issue, which I wanted. You know, I've I I just wanted to have your take on this because I've been writing about this for quite a while. And uh, I wanted to hear your thoughts from a libertarian economist, an Austrian school economist. Uh, and uh, so it's this issue of stakeholder capitalism, uh, which the World Economic Forum has been promoting and trying to roll out across the world. Uh, they deem it a new economic system. Uh, this Great Reset project is really about making stakeholder capitalism universal and they it replaces so-called shareholder capitalism or what they pejoratively call neoliberalism now on page 78 of covid 19 the great reset klaus schwab who claims to be an economist by the way and his co-author define neoliberalism as quote a corpus of ideas and policies that can be loosely defined as favoring competition over solidarity, creative destruction over government intervention, and economic growth over social welfare. That is, stakeholder capitalism favors solidarity, whatever that means, over competition, government intervention over so-called creative destruction, and social welfare over economic growth, as if these latter two could be decoupled somehow. Stakeholder capitalism supposedly benefits customers, suppliers, employees, local communities, and the planet. Uh, this, this uh, I think it resembles what uh, Milton Friedman opposed in his famous essay, The Social Responsibility of Business is to Increase Its Profits, published in the New York Times Magazine in 1971. Interestingly, this stakeholder capitalism was floated the very next year by Klaus Schwab in one of his books. So I think it was in direct response to Milton Friedman. Stakeholder capitalism uses this environmental, social, and governance index on the stock market and in banking to benefit these so-called stakeholders. Uh, but I think the ESG is like a demarcation device in the economy to drive capital toward these approved producers and to drive out non-compliant producers uh, from the market. Uh, I think likewise that I think it's a monopoly, a shared monopoly or, or cartel scheme. The ESG is a pre or extra governmental coercion regime 
which is then followed up by the state with uh, regulations, sanctions, and subsidies. This is exactly what's going on in the U.S. Uh, they're driving this through the corporate world, and then the, the Biden administration is coming along and passing through executive fiat all these different uh, measures. Uh, given this characterization, uh, could you comment on what you think about this stakeholder capitalism, and does it violate free market principles? Well, it's certainly uh, antithetical to the free enterprise system. Uh, the free enterprise system, I think Milton, I'm not a big fan of Milton Friedman, right. but I, I, I'm a pretty good fan of him. But on this one, he was 100% correct. Um, uh, this is just um, uh, the answering wedge of socialism. You know, they've tried socialism in so many guises and they didn't work. And now this is just another guise for, uh, for taking over private industry. Uh, I'm very fond of the uh, idea of reductio ad absurdum, and I tried that with uh, homosexuals and heterosexuals. I'd like to try it now. If it's such a great idea, why do we just impose it on corporations? Why shouldn't we impose it on individuals, uh, on churches, on the government? Uh, and, and if we did, this would be their ruination. I mean, right now, I want to maximize my profits. Uh, the reason I'm uh, uh, on this show with you is because I figured that I would make a profit off of it. Namely, uh, I benefit more than the cost uh, of, uh, to me of doing something else. But uh, if, uh, if we have stakeholder uh, imposed upon me, well, then maybe I should be mowing my neighbor's uh, lawn. <laughs> Or, uh, yeah. I don't know, shopping for, for somebody. Uh, namely, I shouldn't do that which is in my best interest. And I don't mean me personally, but all of us yeah. as individuals, yeah. we all try to maximize our welfare by taking this job and not that job. Well, you can't take this job and not that job because, um, you know, maybe uh, th these people need you more even though they're paying you less. So if we impose this on individuals, most individuals would balk at that and they say, you know, the hell with this. Uh, and we could do it on churches. Um, you know, maybe the Catholic Church should give to Jews uh, because the Jews are now stakeholders or the, the, <laughs> the temple should give to, um, uh, to Muslims or, or whatever because they're stakeholders. I mean, stakeholders are a bunch of thieves. They're, they don't own the property, and somehow yeah. they, they want uh, part of the property. Well, th this is just an attack on, on private property. I, they might as well steal my shirt uh, as impose uh, the, the stuff on me. It's like carjacking. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I think when, when you look at and, – and let's let's do it on government. If we impose stakeholder theory on the U.S. government, well, then the U.S. government should do things for Mexico or, I don't know um, – Bulgaria or, or some yeah. other place that the U.S. government doesn't want to do because the U.S. government is trying to maximize its well-being or its profits. And they were saying, tut, 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 no, you shouldn't do that. There are stakeholders out here, and, and now you should change your operation. Uh, the U.S. government wouldn't like that. The ESG people uh, wouldn't like that. Now, uh, what's the name of the guy that wrote the book uh, attacking Milton Friedman? Uh, Klaus Schwab. Right. We should apply it to him. We should say, yeah. okay, Mr. Schwab, uh, we're, we're stakeholders on your property. Give us um, 100000 uh, yeah. because uh, you're rich and, and we, don't have, we need the money more than you do. We're stakeholders. Uh, see yeah. how he likes uh, being hoist by his own petard, as they would say. Right. Now, what do you suppose, though, this is being driven from the top asset managers in the world, like uh, uh, BlackRock Inc., Larry Fink's the CEO, and he said, point blank, he said, stakeholder capitalism is capitalism. Uh, why do you think these people uh, from these top asset, asset managers, you know, he has, uh, that company, BlackRock, has $10 trillion of assets under management, and they're driving this thing home, uh, forcing corporations to comply and threatening them with basically uh, diverting capital away from them so that you won't, they will not buy your stocks. Basically, they'll starve you of capital investments if you do not comply. Why do you think this, uh, these people are doing this? Well, this is part of a, a woke uh, corporatism. Yeah. I mean, the Chinese had a cultural revolution uh, 20 years ago, and they, they must have killed uh, 10 million people or 100 million people. I mean, 
we now have a cultural revolution. Yeah. Happily, we're not killing millions of people, but it's it sort of, in Yiddish, it's called mishigas, craziness. Uh, it just sort of takes over people. It took over the Chinese, and now happily they, they're past it, and it's our turn to be crazy. Uh, the the um, uh, the medical people are now uh, uh, what is it medical schools are now uh, going to uh, uh, invoke um, what do you call it um, uh, affirmative action and they're going to take um, doctors uh, not on the basis of ability to be doctors but on the basis of pigment or uh, uh, plumbing internal plumbing and uh, and we'll have worse doctors than we otherwise would. Uh, yeah. Do you think they'll even do it with airline pilots? You, you, you have to wonder. Probably they will because they don't go on uh, on uh, commercial planes. They're very rich and they have private planes. So they might say the hell with everyone else. Um, yeah. But, I mean, if they're going to pull this on doctors and on um, airline pilots, uh, you know, the, the craziness knows no bounds. I mean – Yeah, they're already gonna, doing it on air traffic controllers at this there juncture. There you go. I mean, yeah. we have to have a female or black or, um, I don't know um, – Bald-headed or hair, uh, hair, uh, her suit, uh, uh, traffic controllers. I mean, you, what you want from a traffic controller or a pilot or a doctor or an engineer or a chemist is talent. I mean, if we want to cure cancer, we, we need the first team in there. We don't need people who got in, uh, into uh, chemistry uh, PhDs uh, not on the basis of ability to do chemistry. Um, they take the NBA. If you're going to apply this, you know the NBA is I think 85% black, mm. way more than 13%, which uh, is their proportion of the population. Right. So here's another reductio ad absurdum. If it's such a great idea to have this, let's apply it to the NBA and the NFL, uh, the football yeah. league, and and now you get some short, fat Jewish guys who can't jump and can't <laughs> run, and, and it's unfair that we're not in the NBA. Uh, but they don't want to apply it to that. But if they were logically consistent, they would say, yes, we got to kick out all those splendid athletes who happen to be black because there are too many blacks in the NBA. We, we, we got to limit them to 13%. That's what Harvard and um, North Carolina were, were, were doing. Uh, uh, hopefully the Supreme Court uh, will stop them. Although what they'll probably do now is say, well, you know, God forbid we pick on the base of race. We're now going to choose on the base of things that are correlated with race. Right, exactly. Maybe, uh, poverty or right. uh, li living Lived in... Experience, yeah. Lived experience, or yeah, living yeah. in Harlem, or uh, what? Or the top, another. My favorite one is the top ten percent of all high schools. Uh, even though there's some high schools, the, the Bronx High School of Science uh, are very, very smart kids. And then there are other high schools where, where the top 10 percent are probably in, in the lowest decile of, of the uh, smart ones. So they'll use that, and hopefully the Supreme Court will be wise enough to say, ah, uh -uh, you can't do that either. But uh, we'll have to wait and see. Okay. Uh, I mean, what would you say to those so-called libertarians that would suggest that uh, property owners can create whatever criteria they want for investment? So if they want to create an ESG uh, criteria, uh, they can do so because uh, it's their property. Or, or in the case of their assets under management, it's the property that they've been entrusted with by uh, – by these various uh, shareholders, whether they be states, pensions, or whatever. Absolutely. If ESG were private, uh, God bless them. I, I mean, I wouldn't join them, but uh, they have a right to do it. Uh, uh, Jews have a right to boycott Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Um, uh, gays have a right to boycott um, chicken fillet, Chick Fil A, I think it's called, because yeah. it's owned by people who are um, uh, I don't know uh, not, religious, yeah, Christian yeah, religious. Yeah, they're religious, and and they don't want to, uh, and and these people that don't want to uh, bake a cake for gay people. Uh, yeah. They have a right not to. So ESG, if it was done privately, would be um, non-problematic from a libertarian point of view. I might not join it, yeah. but that's a different issue. But the problem is that the governments now uh, take this up and, uh, and yeah. run with the ball. But the point is that I would tell even private ones, why uh, limit ESG to corporations? Why not to individuals, to churches, to um, uh, soccer uh, teams or, or, or to the NBA? Well, well, they very well may apply ESG to individuals so that, uh, for example, if you if – you, um, uh, if you were, let's say, if you had a central bank digital currency, for example, 
and you could limit basically where spending took took place, uh, what people could purchase, you know, through the Fed. Uh, then they could say, you know, you're not meeting your environmental, social, and governance index quota. Likewise, you can't buy gasoline, or you can't buy a rifle, or you can't buy whatever. Uh, so they may apply this to individuals. It's very possible. Well, if they do, then the market will will solve that. Like right now, Nigel Farage in England, yeah, uh, his bank told him, right. you can't bank with us. So he goes to another bank, and the other bank says no. And they went to six or seven banks, and they all said no. And people right. who don't understand economics say, well, this shows that capitalism is evil. No. The banking industry is one of the most heavily regulated industries of all industries. If right. it were not regulated, the um, the Jones Bank or the Smith Bank would uh, say to Nigel Farage, "Sure, you know, we'll we'll take your your custom." Uh, so, <coughs> so what they do is they take an industry which is heavily regulated and they say, well, that's yeah. what capitalism is. No, that's right. not what capitalism is. So uh, boycotts, anyone should be able to boycott anything as long as it's done privately. Yeah, so with the ESG, I just wanted to make this distinction. This is being driven privately, but it's, it's, it's these corporate entities trying to get out ahead of legislation, which they know is following. So if it weren't for the regulations, the regulators, it wouldn't be happening. But it is being driven like an extra governmental or pre-governmental coercion scheme uh, as such. Right. Look, right now, uh, people are free to boycott um, anything they want. But once the government gets in there, it, there's compulsion. Right. Whereas if it's non-compulsion... You know, uh, look, I, um, you know I, I don't like Chinese food, so I'll boycott Chinese food, let's say. Actually, I, yeah. I don't like Chinese food, but uh, <laughs> I should be free not to go to a Chinese restaurant. And the Chinese restaurant should be free to boycott people like me, uh, say, free enterprise economists. They could uh, put up a sign, no free enterprise economists allowed <laughs> in this store. Now, the, the odds of them doing it are slim to none. Uh, yeah. Because of competition uh, and a whole, whole, whole host of other reasons, but but um, uh, discrimination is, is a human right. Okay. Well, on that note, I'd like to move over to another topic, and I've been reading uh, some of your work about it. And to be honest, I uh, I went into reading your works with a disagreement with you. Uh, I I must confess up front that I sort of have a tendency to agree with Hoppe on the question of immigration and his suggestion that, you know, goods uh, are invited and uh, free trade is something that people invite. They, they invited these goods across the border because they purchased them. Uh, what, what he says, he distinguishes this from immigration and he says, you know, the, these immigrants, especially illegal immigrants so-called, are not invited. Uh, they weren't uh, given, you know, the okay to cross the border, and they're uninvited, and, and they are infringing. Uh, you know, we get into the question of public property, of course, that's a big conundrum, but they're, they're at least infringing on my right to public property, and uh, this influx of un uninvited immigrants is costing me money. It's, uh, so how do you just, I, I read your distinction and it's pretty, pretty convincing, but I find myself still resisting this argument. <laughs> I gotta be honest with you. I, I just don't want to have unfettered immigration. Uh, and it just seems to me that it is a cost for uh, the citizen uh, who are compelled to uh, basically uh, finance this whole regime. Uh, so how do you, first of all, how do you distinguish between, uh, or how do you address this distinction that Hoppe is making between f free trade and free influx of immigrants? Well, before I answer, let me just make a comment about Hans, who is a buddy of mine, a friend yeah. of mine for many years. I regard Hans not only as one of the most um, creative and uh, uh, brilliant libertarian thinkers now living, but I regard him as one of the most brilliant, creative libertarian thinkers who ever lived. 
He is absolutely magnificent, right up there with Murray Rothbard, and you can hardly. In fact, um, he may be one of the greatest philosophers, philosophers uh, of, of our time. Yeah. And, and economists, and when I yeah. when I hand out compliments mentioning Murray Rothbard, that's about as high as I can mention. So yeah. Hans is brilliant. Right. Secondly, on this point, he's also brilliant. He makes the following point. He says, "Look, if you have uh, imports of a shirt, there's an importer and exporter. Two people agree." If there's uh, investment, uh, I invest a million dollars in um, uh, France in, in a steel mill. Again, th there's an investor and an investee. Uh, two people have to agree. So that's fine. But in the third case, the, the immigrant just shows up without any buy or leave. And it's a, it's a, a, unilateral, a unilateral decision. And what Hans is saying is that, look, just because you favor free trade and free investment doesn't mean you have to favor free um, open immigration. And he is absolutely right. There is that disanalogy. Now, there are two things we have to be concerned about. One is deontology. Is the libertarian, uh, is the immigrant violating rights? And secondly, we have to... Uh, Bad guys. And not only mm -hmm. bad guys. Suppose there were a trillion Martians, a quadrillion Martians, and they're all nice guys. Do we really want a, a quadrillion Martians uh, to come in, live in the United States and vote and, you know, uh, their way, the Martian way, whatever the Martian, don't ask me what the Martian <laughs> way is. But uh, so there are two uh, considerations that we have to overcome to get the correct view. One is deontology and the other is... We've got to keep ourselves safe, and not only from bad guys, but from multitudes. I mean, we don't want a, a quadrillion people in the United States, uh, too many. Okay, so let's do the deontology first. Mm -hmm. So here's the situation where Hans is wrong. A Martian comes, uh, or come be from Africa or uh, India, who knows where. A Martian comes, and he, uh, he starts homesteading in the middle of uh, Alaska or in the middle of the Rocky Mountains in uh, Wyoming. And along comes somebody from ICE, and he says, uh, you know, where are your papers? What are you doing here? He says, oh, I'm just uh, mixing my labor with the land here. And uh, the guy said, well, you know, <laughs> you're not a citizen. Go away. And uh, the Martian says, well, wait, I thought you people were libertarians. What libertarian rule am I violating? This is virgin territory. Nobody has ever set foot on this, uh, these hundred acres in the middle of the Rocky Mountains. So go away. Leave me alone. I haven't violated any law. Now, Hans's answer to that, I think, is preposterous. Mm. What he says is that the U.S. government really owns that land in trust for all the citizens. And I say, Hans, you're an anarchist. Where, where, where did you get the government uh, owning anything in trust? And mm. the point is that Hans is not only an anarchist, he's also a, uh, a Lockean. Uh, he believes that the, mm -hmm. the way you get just property is by mixing your labor with virgin territory. Well, nobody ever mixed their uh, 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 labor with virgin territory until this Martian. So he's the rightful owner. And he and Stefan Kinsella have done yeoman work in showing that it's the first guy who mixes his labor with the land, not the second guy or the last mm -hmm. guy. Because mm -hmm. then, you know, the last guy would only uh, be able to kick at, uh, the predecessors out. So Hans is absolutely wrong when he says that somehow this Martian is violating libertarian law. He's not violating libertarian law. He's acting in accordance with libertarian law. And Hans's attempt to uh, paper this over by saying that the government uh, owns the, all the land in trust is just nonsense. It's anti-Lockean, and he's a, a profound Lockean, so he's violating his own principles. Okay, I think I've dealt with the deontology. Now let's look at how we can defend ourselves from a quadrillion Martians. The way we yeah. do it is we privatize every square inch of the country. And if every square inch of the country were privatized, then uh, if somebody comes, they're a trespasser. Yeah. And we tell the Martian, hey, uh, this land over here, uh, it's been homesteaded. Now, you run into a problem because there is such a thing called sub-marginal land. Land in the middle of Alaska or in the middle of the Rocky Mountains in Wyoming, uh, it's... Uh, not economically viable to homestead, mix your labor with it because um, we have so much land compared to the people, thank God. 
Uh, the answer to that is um, uh, voluntary um, uh, groups that say, hey, uh, we, we want to privatize um, every inch, even though it's going to cost you something. Let's do it out of charitable or defensive purposes. And that would be the way to do it. And not only every square inch of the land, but every square inch of the water. One of my books is on why we should privatize uh, rivers, lakes, oceans, whatever. We've got to privatize the Mississippi River. Otherwise, these mar Martians will uh, get a boat and sit in the middle of the Mississippi River with a houseboat, and we don't want that either. So I think that the proper libertarian view uh, on deontology, and which will defend us against masses of people, whether they're criminals or not, would be uh, privatize every square inch of the country, and that would be the answer. So the proper answer is open borders. Anyone is welcome here, and if you don't like it, start privatizing land. Uh, now look, we're not in charge. We're, what we're trying to do is just come up with the, the proper libertarian analysis. And that's the proper libertarian analysis. We can have our cake and eat it. We can have our deontology. And we can protect ourselves against bad guys and, uh, and masses of people. Okay, but, um, you know, we're, we're not talking about, un, uh, you know, unharvested, un, unhomesteaded land. We're, we're talking about public space, so-called roads and uh, parks and, uh, you know, streets and, uh, you know, places where we go to basically meet, uh, you know, and uh, travel and so on and so forth. You've argued that, you know, uh, immigration control effectively increases state power. I mean, that's one of the arguments you made in your paper on immigration, reply to Hoppe. Uh, but doesn't, uh, on the other hand, doesn't immigration, unfettered immigration, increase state power as well? For example, uh, the, uh, it increases state power to address the increased crime, which you refer to. It, it increases state power to increase social welfare, health benefits to immigrants, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you're right. Those are dangers. Um, but... When you say unfettered immigration, I am fettering it. How am I fettering it? By privatizing the roads and the parks. Uh, Central okay. Park in New York City should be private. So no immigrant can park in there and say, well, I'm setting up shop here. Uh, no immigrant should uh, go to the middle of Alaska, uh, where the, the next um, occupant is uh, 200 miles away, and, and start homesteading, because that'll all be owned. So if it's all owned... Now, look, if... If, the, if you have a welfare system, that would be very bad to have immigrants. So the answer is get rid of the welfare system. Remember, yeah, this I, is a libertarian analysis. So right. you can't pull uh, uh, welfare on against me, uh, against the position I'm adumbrating, because I would just say, well, then let's get rid of welfare. Yeah, agreed. Let's, no, get, absolutely. Public, I, let's I, get rid of public schools. Let's get rid of uh, public parks. Let's get rid of public libraries. It should all be privatized. And now, uh, all of a sudden, th this uh, situation looks a lot better. Yeah, and, and then there's the political question, and I, I think you could agree with this, is that uh, if we do have this current setup that we do, and uh, immigration happens to benefit the political party uh that's in chart, you know, that's basically gaining the fealty of these immigrants uh, and likewise gaining power and the ability to stay in power uh, because they increase the social welfare to these immigrants. And then these immigrants in some states can vote uh, and uh, they are being given the right to vote in some states with and with the muddled electoral processes we have, even in the federal elections. So it, it does seem to benefit those parties or party that uh, wants to increase immigration and to allow it to go without any kind of impediments. Yes, they're, they're giving immigrants uh, driver's licenses um, right. right away and, and they can vote. And they can, but that's not the libertarian society. The libertarian society would be total privatization of everything. And now how do they come in? They, now they have to be invited, because if they just come in, they're trespassers, and we kick them out. Yeah, but short of the libertarian society, how do we respond 
in the you know say in the case of the United States right now and the way things are, we don't have we we haven't privatized everything and you know short of a you know immediate abolition of the state, uh, we're we're going to have public property per se, and likewise we're going to have this problem. Uh, we're going to have the problem of of uh, immigrants coming, and especially when you have policies in place that are allowing them to come with basically no restraint, uh, how do we deal with it, you know, outside of the ideal libertarian scenario? Well, that's a brilliant argument against me, and I congratulate you for it. You're a good Hans Hoppian. Uh, that, that's very good, but it's a little unfair. Okay. Because I am giving a libertarian analysis. And if you say, well, forget about libertarianism, what should we do now? Um, I don't know. That, that, that's, that, I mean, I'm a libertarian. Yeah. So I can only answer the, the libertarian issue. Oh, look, let's take an, an analogy. Um, I oppose the minimum wage law. The yeah. minimum wage law is no good. But suppose the situation was such that um, um, uh, Bill Gates would uh, give money to uh, – I, I oppose abuse would create unemployment. But Bill Gates is going to give uh, jobs to anyone who would be unemployed by the minimum wage. What would I then say? What, what I would then say is my analysis of the minimum wage precludes a Bill Gates. And yeah, I would yeah. say now that my analysis of immigration precludes the present situation. Yeah, because I'm a libertarian. I don't want to get mired in in the present situation. I don't want to be like Milton Friedman was um, accused of being an efficiency expert for the state. Mm -hmm. He would come right. up with all sorts of ways to make state um, uh, interventions work better. You know. Yeah. Well, I don't want to do that. Um, I, I I I think it's unfair to ask a libertarian what would you do. In a non-libertarian situation, because we yeah. libertarians are limited to libertarianism. And okay. if you say, well, given that we don't have libertarianism, what should we now do? Well, all bets are off. The libertarians have nothing to say. All we can – we, I believe in specialization and division of labor. Uh, you can't ask a doctor to build a bridge. You can't ask a, um, uh, 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 an architect to um, do heart surgery. Well, you can't ask a libertarian what to do in a non-libertarian situation, except get rid of the non-libertarian situation. Yeah. Didn't Rothbard somewhere say, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, that we could use the state to dismantle it, uh, that the state could be used as an instrument to dismantle the state, and that, it might, you know, that might be the only way to do it. Well, you know, Murray, in my writing, I call him Rothbard one and Rothbard two, because yeah. there was a time when he believed in open immigration. And then there was a time when he didn't, which shows that, I mean, if Murray changes his mind uh, while well, he's mature, I don't mean when he was 18 or 16 years old, right. but in his maturity, he changed his mind. This shows that this is a, a real rough issue. It yeah. sort of reminds me of um, abortion, where you have Ron Paul, who is pro-life. Right. And Murray Rothbard, who is pro-choice, and you can't get two more what better leaders of the libertarian movement than those two, right. and, and yet they're polar opposites. Yeah. Uh, so uh, immigration is a very, very tough, complicated issue, I, and I think I've um, analyzed it correctly, but it's vulnerable to your argument, namely, well, what do we do now? And, and my answer is, what we do now is we um, make a libertarian society. Okay, that's fair enough. I mean, I can't, what can I say to that? I mean, I agree. That's what I'd like too. Yeah. And uh, last, last but not least, and uh, certainly I don't want to drive a wedge between you and me, <laughs> but uh, there's a slight elephant in the room, uh, and that is your recent debate with Am, uh, with Seyfedin Amos about the Israel question. I, I just want to give you a chance for some kind of reprisal here uh, or a kind of rejoinder to what you had to say there. I'm not, I am not qualified to speak on the issue of Israel and uh, the Palestinian question 
So I don't pretend to have that kind of, uh, that kind of versatility in, in terms of that issue. But did you have anything you'd like to say uh, following up that debate? Yes, um, he, he is a, a good guy. Uh, Saifdeen Amos is a um, Muslim or an Arab. I'm not sure of his background, but I, uh, I um, cooperated with him before this debate. This debate was just a couple of weeks ago or a month or two ago. But two or three years ago, he had me on a show, and I forget what we were talking about, but it was on libertarianism, and we were 100% in agreement with each other. And he is a, a good libertarian. Just as Hans is a good libertarian, but wrong on this issue, well, uh, Safe Dean is a good libertarian, but wrong on this issue. Now, you'll remember that the Lockean theory says the first homesteader of the territory is the rightful owner. Well, how old is Muslimism or Islam? It started in around 700. So it's just 1,300 years old. How old is Catholicism? Just 2,000 years old. Uh, started with Jesus Christ. How old is um, uh, Judaism? 3,800 years old. These new religions are new kids on the block. This should is not definitive, but it should give you an idea of who was there first. Who was uh, building stuff in, Pal in what used to be Palestine, which now is Israel. And remember, he who homesteaded the land first is the rightful owner of it. And, and we don't have any, um, uh, uh, you know, time dimension. Uh, you know, uh, we, we go back as far as we can. Uh -huh. So I would say that the, the case of the um, Jews as against the Muslims or the Islamicists uh, in, uh, in Israel is very much in favor of the Jewish side because we were there first. But but property isn't collectively owned. It's 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 privately, personally, individually owned. So that's that's interesting. Um, you know, in in our book uh, that I uh, did with Alan Fudeman, what we said it was a classical liberal case. Yeah. Not an anarchist case, but a classical liberal case. And uh, and we said right off in the first paragraph or the first chapter, Israel is not uh, anarcho-capitalist. Right. And, and we said, well, Israel is wrong on this, Israel is wrong on that. But, but, but we're not talking about uh, Israel, the government, versus private people. We're talking about Israel, the government, versus Arab governments, right? And, and when, when you compare the, the, the governments or when you compare the collectives, you're right. From the strict libertarian point of view, property can only be owned individually. But if you um, take that position, then you're sort of out of the uh, debate because the debate is between groups. Mm -hmm. And there are, in one of the chapters, we do talk about certain groups, uh, the Cohens, the, the Levi's, that were individual groups, and we trace it that way. But the, the argument is not only individual, but it's also uh, group-wise and it's also nation-wise. Mm -hmm. So we're defending Israel, the government. We're defending the Jewish people. We're defending the Israel government versus, say, Egypt or um, uh, Jordan. We're defending the Jewish people, the collective versus other collectives. And we're also uh, defending individuals. So it's a three-stage thing, like a wedding cake or something. Individuals, groups, and nations. And on all three grounds, we say that the Israelis or the Jews, have a better uh, case for the ownership of the contested area. It's very much like uh, in South Africa. South Africa was built up not by black people. There were very few black people when the, um, uh, uh, the uh, English and the um, um, uh, Dutch. Dutch came there. Right. And what happened is that they had a better economy, so the black people from the uh, contigu contiguous states came in and started working and then started outnumbering them. Well, it's very similar in, um, in, uh, in Israel, what is now Israel. Uh, there were virtually no Arabs there. It was uh, uh, swamps, or nowadays they call it wetlands. It was swamps and desert. And the Jews made the desert bloom, and then Arab people came in as workers. So the, the Jews were there first. So if you're going to try to figure out who has justice in the contentious areas, 
I, I think the Jews were there first. And then, you know, the issue is, where, when did the Palestinian people start? In the 1930s and the 1940s, all of the Jewish organizations were called Palestine. The Palestinians were, were sort of um, Johnny-come-latelys, Johnny-come-latelys, you know, they came mm -hmm. afterward. Well, if you come afterward, your claim to the disputed property is not as good as the people who were there first. So that, that's sort of the essence of the book and the essence of my side of the debate. Uh, but I acknowledge that Amos was a, a good debating partner. Uh, he was uh, intelligent and wise and, and witty, and he did a good job. But I think that the justice uh, was on my side. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I would push a little bit here. Uh, when we talked about immigration, you were saying that, you know, uh, I'm not arguing. I'm arguing as a libertarian. So, are you arguing as a libertarian with reference to the uh, to the uh, Israel-Palestine question? Well, I'm not arguing as an anarcho-capitalist libertarian. I'm arguing as a classical liberal, okay. as a minarchist, uh, as a person that accepts governments because it's uh, the Israeli government versus other governments. So, if you say you're all, you see what what, and we have a whole chapter on Murray Rothbard in that book. Okay, and Murray uh, is very much on the Palestinian side against the uh, Israeli side. Um, the the, um, the 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 point that Murray makes, I think, he goes back to 1870, and and he says, well, there were a lot of Palestinians in there then, and we go back 2,000 years uh, before that. Mm -hmm. So um, we we disagree with Murray on that. I mean, we're not a cult. We're not an Ayn Rand cult. You're allowed right. to disagree with each other and, and be right. friends and, and be colleagues. Um, um, uh, you know, Hans and I are co-authors on, on several occasions, and we disagree also. Uh, so the, there's nothing wrong with agreeing and disagreeing. And I would love to uh, co-author something with um, Amos um, Safe Dean on, on another issue. Um, yeah. I, I was hoping that the two of us together could, um, could, set, could solve the problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, um, Michael, I promised you an hour. Uh, yes. We're over an hour, but this was lovely. I really enjoyed uh, I think this is the first time we met face to face. We've uh, communicated uh, uh, in right. other ways, but this was just a delight. And um, yeah, um, thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Great. Thanks so much, Walter. Bye bye. Take care. You're listening to Wrecked with Michael Rechtenwald. Find more episodes wherever you get your podcasts and get more content like this on Mises.org.